Welcome back from the lunch. I hope you had the chance to rest, get some energy for what awaits you for the rest of the afternoon. My name is Tommaso della Vecchia. I'm responsible for development and advocacy at European Schoolnet, and I have the pleasure to introduce you to the next session. Um, yeah, we'll let a few more people join in, and then we're going to get started with the next session, which is about policy and business actions and collaboration in the field of data for education. So I'll sit down with my guest, which I will introduce to you uh, in a little bit. We have also a guest from the European Commission joining uh, remotely with us, jo Johannes uh, Gaviotis. Thank you for joining. And this panel specifically will actually look at some more practical actions, policies, initiatives that are happening right now in the countries, action by decision makers, by uh, ministries of education and national, also local level, and also by companies and other actors. To start this first conversation, which, by the way, will open also to your question uh, in a bit, if you would like also to contribute with uh, your knowledge and experience, uh, we thought important to start actually with a short intervention from the European Commission, Giovanni Gaviotis from DG Connect, who is a policy officer in the unit uh, G2 Interactive Technologies Digital for Culture and Education. Johannes is working especially on digital education for what concerns the areas of educational technologies, the application of artificial intelligence in education, and the European Student Card Initiative and the data space for skills. Johannes, thanks for joining us today. Um, I would let you introduce our audience to your programs and, and your unit and DG vision for what concerns data in education. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello, hello from cloudy Luxembourg. Uh, I wish I were there in sunny Dublin. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, but anyways, in a few days I will be in Greece, so I don't, uh, I can't have any complaints. So my name is Ioannis Gaviotis. I work for the European Commission, and today I will share with you how important educational technology is for us. The outline goes like this. I will shortly present you four concrete examples that showcase the approaches that we have taken in order to support and advance educational technology. And then shortly, I will talk about open current opportunities in this field. So let me share my screen. Okay. So, first I would like to, to, to show the spread of educational technology, and I have organized it in two axes. Uh, I, we all agree that uh, educational technology has found its way in various educational settings, from primary school, secondary education, universities, and most notably for us, informal vocational lifelong learning. This is very important uh, aspect of education and training. And of course, we will find educational technology in many learning activities along the bottom of the screen. So we have intelligent tutoring systems where the educational content is tailored to students' needs and progress. Uh, we want to relieve uh, the teacher from the tedious task of uh, student assessment. So we have automated assessment systems and we certainly uh, have been using educational technology to carry out clerical, let's call them, tasks, uh, such as organizing activities, training uh, resources, etc. Et and uh, last, I would mention the possibility and uh, the, 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 the prospect that open with virtual reality or even augmented reality to enhance the training experience by simulation or via game playing. So, having testified to the ubiquity of educational technology, Europe recognizes its importance and actively wants to support it. So, I will continue with the four concrete examples that are just indicative of the actions or the uh, ways we try to support educational technology. The first one is called Impact EdTech. The ultimate goal of Impact EdTech is to support the European startups and SMEs to move from promising prototypes 
towards viable projects. Impact at Tech sets up an incubation environment offering both business and access to market support and access to an educational ecosystem. I will not talk much about it because I know that uh, some of you uh, are well acquainted with this project and uh, I will move on directly to the next example, which is the DS for skills. So this project aims to identify sources for skills data to be used for analytical and statistical purposes. And what do I mean by skills data? We are talking about databases of job offers, lists of curricula, certifications, inventory of topics studied at all levels of education. So the aim here is to try to inventory and collect those data and, be, and let them be as a more accessible as possible to the people who actually need to use them to draw important and useful conclusions. Next one comes Empower ED. Empower ED, you may have not heard about it because it's a relative newcomer. It's a fresh endeavor that's being started. So you won't find any information up to now for the in the web. But anyway, what's what's the goal? Be behind Empower ID. Now, policymakers have set some goals, but at times they would use insiders' information about how to implement their agendas. So, in this task, they could utilize support from the stakeholders from the specific ecosystem so that they can move forward towards their goals. Now, I know that I already said many bad words in a few sentences, such as stakeholders, ecosystem. So I will move away from, this, uh, from these things and I will move on to a very pragmatic, very uh, important, my, actually my favorite, uh, let's say, initiative or project concerning uh, education and uh, technology. And this is Code Week. Code Week is a grassroots initiative which aims to spread computational thinking and coding and digital skills. In the last five years, 15 million people have participated in the activities organized with the average age of 11 years. So we're talking about kids now, kids in the primary schools mainly and the secondary schools. The initiative has trained or involves more than 20,000 teachers. We're talking about massive numbers. So Code Week tries to lower the barrier for teachers and tries to help them integrate programming and technology in their everyday teaching practices. It also aims to provide equal access to digital skills to all children regardless of their economic background or gender. This would conclude the description of those uh, examples, either existing or forthcoming. And now I would move on to tell you about some open opportunities in this field, in educational technology. So there are specific policy initiatives in Europe, like the Digital Education Action Plan and the Digital Decade. I'm sure that you have heard about them. They have set very ambitious goals. For example, I, for example, I would uh, say about Digital Decade that it stipulates a substantial increase for ICT specialists, for IT people and the skills of the public. And when we're talking about skills of the public, we are talking about basic digital skills for the general population. So all or a, a large percentage, the, the, the actual target is 80% of the population should have those basic digital skills by the end of this program, by the end of the decade. And we also aim to 
uh, help with increasing the number of people having advanced digital skills. We're talking now about professionals and we're talking about professionals not only in the IT field, because we recognized that you may not be an IT person, you may not be a computer person, a software engineer, but still you need in your area of expertise to become somewhat of an ICT specialist. You need to very well know how to uh, use uh, those uh, technologies. And there are a lot of funding opportunities in the Horizon and the Digital Europe programs. I will just mention three of those open opportunities. First and foremost, there is currently an open call for the design and the delivery of innovative bachelors and master programs in digital areas and multidisciplinary ones. The objective is to support higher education institutions like universities, making them world leaders in training for digital specialists and to increase their capability of the training offer for advanced technologies. Some concrete numbers on this initiative. This call will lead to seven to eight consortia, depending on the budget, where, whereby at least 150 students will get trained across each consortium. So we are talking about more than 1,000 students being trained overall in digital areas and more multidisciplinary subjects. And we are just setting up these programs, which of course are going to be used in the future to, uh, to go on with, uh, with their goals. Next, we are talking about the micro-credentials. Micro-credentials certify the learning outcomes of short-term learning experiences. For example, you take a short course or some training, not, let's say, in the framework of a university degree or program. And there, you can use the micro-credentials because they offer a very flexible and targeted way to help people develop knowledge, skills, and competencies they need for their personal and professional development. The last one is, again, uh, some a new idea that will uh, explode, let's say, next uh, year with the Year of Skills. It's called Cybersecurity Academy. Here, the aim is to set up an umbrella that will try to bring together training and uh, other stakeholders, actually, uh, that uh, have to do with cybersecurity, how to handle um, the, the, the problems related to cybersecurity. And this is, again, a very uh, important topic of discussion and uh, uh, funding. So, uh, I hope you got a grip of the currently open opportunities. There are, of course, a lot more, but uh, I would recap and close by trying to show that these examples that I have uh, talked about before, they give the flavor of how active Europe has been in the field of educational technology and digital in education. So we have a two-way, let's say, interaction. From the one hand, we strive for the use of digital technology in the education. This is educational technology. And from the other hand, we need more digital skills, both basic and advanced to be on offer by our educational systems. And what's the final goal? The ultimate goal is to achieve what is called the digital sovereignty. And digital sovereignty is fundamental to build our own technological capabilities. Thus, we need to train our future workforce on solutions developed in the European Union and made by European educational technology people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes, very much for giving the perspective of your uh, unit and, uh, and Director General so that we see how also 
definitely our members and uh, participants to our conference, of course, could use those mechanisms to test and uh, and deploy those uh, those policies and uh, attempts to make a good use of edtech. Uh, of course, thanks a lot for being with us. Now we are going to actually move to our uh, speakers who are with us on stage. I will uh, just introduce them briefly to you and then we'll just get a uh, deep dive into our conversation. Uh, on my left, we have uh, Philippe Ajuelos, uh, who joined in 2019 the Digital Education Department of the French National Education uh, Ministry to contribute to uh, the educational digital policy. Currently, he is Ministerial Administrator of Data, Algorithms, and Source Codes. And of course, you can uh, contradict me if I said anything and wrong or add to, to it. Uh, also, another perspective from the public sector, Tero Hotunen, who uh, worked on the, at the Ministry of Education and Culture of Finland as a specialist and development manager in tasks related to digitalization since 2015 and at the ministry has been involved in implementing and guiding the development of data warehouses, digital services and information reporting solutions for early childhood, education and care, and primary and lower secondary education. And finally, we have a different perspective uh, represented by Dr. Kevin Marshall, who has a uh, Bachelor on Psychology uh, from the University College of Dublin, a Master on Occupational Psychology from the University of Hull, and a PhD on Educational Measurement and Research from the Boston College. He currently also is the Head of Learning and Skills at Microsoft Ireland, and definitely he will uh, give us perspectives on, on several angles of the topic that we're about to tackle. Now we heard buzzwords and uh, also some policy orientation until now also from uh, the previous speakers, which were very informative. We will try to dig into perhaps uh, really uh, local and national practices and initiatives. But before that, of course, we have to focus on the purpose of such uh, initiatives. So I would like to start with you and also with the other speakers. But Philippe, what is the purpose? What is the, the strategy and the vision of the French Ministry of Education when we talk about uh, the use of data in education? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your invitation. It's uh, an honor to be with you today. And uh, I'm very happy personally to be here in the real life uh, with you uh, after uh, two years of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so my name is uh, uh, Philippe Ajbelos. I'm the, I confirm, <laughs> I'm the administrator of data, algorithm, and source code of the French Ministry uh, of Education and Youth. And my job is to, mainly is to value uh, the data collected from all the software information system used for the public service of education uh, to improve services or create new services based on AI with uh, research labs, uh, ed tech companies, and but also uh, I have to, to train with a million people in education um, and acculturate a future generation teachers parents to technology with an ethical and civic approach. And finally, I have to be sure that it's a reali reality in the, in the class. Um, in France, our main concern is to exploit student digital traces uh, because there is a huge potential to be explored. First of all, to uh, develop tools to improve the daily life of um, the teachers and schools, but also to offer students a differentiated and personalized pathway. How can we do this? We have decided, because you have to decide before, <laughs> uh, we have decided to set up the, the Education Data Hub. The Education Data Hub is a big challenge because we have to collate and structure the data and it's a major challenge because the data heritage 
is currently not very legible, highly fragmented, and not very interoperable. There is a lack uh, of technological and human resources. Very good, thanks so much. And I will be curious to see also if other uh, ministries uh, identify with these words and challenges. But uh, Tero, also, I would like to hear from, from the Finnish perspective, what is what's the vision, what are the opportunities that you see in the use of data for, for education? Yes, thank you. So, <coughs> as uh, in Finland, we have been making, uh, preparing a vision for digitalization in education this year. So, uh, as a, like this umbrella term, as digitalization, it, it, it uh, contains lots of things like uh, um, competences and stuff, but uh, regarding data, uh, we have three main objectives in future years. And when I'm talking about education data, a small definition here, so uh, I'm referring to this data that we collect from the education providers. I think this situation is the same in many countries. So in ECEC and also in pre-primary, primary and lower secondary, lower primary school, uh, the master data that is uh, available is on the education provider side. So mostly in Finland, it's municipalities that runs the uh, data. And, and uh, when I'm talking about now in, in, my, uh, in my speech about this um, education data, I'm referring to this data that is transferred from the municipalities data to this national uh, uh, data warehouse that we have in ECEC and also in uh, primary and lower, lower, um, uh, lower secondary uh, school level. So the three things that we are be, we are doing within the next four or five years is to we have to improve the quality of the data uh, because when we have like 300 municipalities running those data warehouses locally and then we ha want to have like interoperability data from those data has international. So we have been noticing that the quality is not the same when we transfer it. The second part of this one goal is the interoperability that was, um, I was glad to know, uh, notice that it was mentioned in earlier um, panel, panels m most of the time. So we know that. And also why we are focusing on the data quality is that we, we have also noticed that the maturity level of for example, AI technologies, it's mostly not there yet. That, that is promised and what, what is delivered. So we decided that in the meantime, we are focusing on the quality and the interoperability. So when the technologies are matured a bit more, then we have like better data resources. The second one that we have, that we have the data, but we are not fully, um, fully uh, uh, utilizing it, the data. So we have to gain more access to different uh, levels of administration to the data S and also that uh, we have uh, more types of data so we have like this operational data so how much how many pupils are there and what the grades are and stuff like that but also we might need data from um, uh, quality of the education so a different kind of assessment data national assessment data but also funding data so when we con combine those types of education we can use them for example, making predictions or micro simulations when we are doing legislative work, so we can use those data to, for example, have some kind of <laughs> some kind of um, uh, predictions. And the third part is uh, supporting knowledge management. So when we have uh, the the thing that we have been uh, trying for is to have this n common data. Uh, warehouse nationally, so the education providers can use it, but also researchers can use it, and also other authorities. So I think that those are the three key parts that we are driving in our vision. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tero. And uh, yeah, it makes me think about something we discussed uh, previously about the, the the investment that uh, is needed, the cost of setting up these system warehouses and uh, models to interpret data. Kevin, do you, do you have a different point of view on it? Uh, what's uh, Microsoft's stand uh, on it in Ireland, perhaps, or also by your experience? Where do you see actually a potential for data and where instead you see perhaps uh, not such a, uh, 
an opportunity to to create something further. Okay, thank you. Um, nice to be here. Um, just um, I've worked for Microsoft for just over 19 years, but prior to that, I worked in Boston Public Schools for 15 years, and I was a data analyst. And I worked on, and this is in the 90s. Um, so part of the work they did was using data. The philosophy at the time in the States was all around data-driven instruction, um, using the testing programs um, and the results of the testing programs and the breaking down of the tests to try and help teachers think about their instructional practice, um, what was working, what wasn't working, how they could look at the test, um, what it was telling them apart from a result, um, a percentile or a stain score that like ranked the school or the kid within the classroom. Um, so um, a lot of experience in those days of thinking about the value of data uh, as well as the potential pitfalls. Um, and I think that work and those conversations uh, have gone on for the last 30 years or so and are still um, very prevalent today and, and really critical. I think what's changed um, is the proliferation of data and also the proliferation of the technology um, that enhances uh, certain um, products and services um, and this notion, this language, which I think can be very confusing, one around digital transformation, what does that actually mean uh, across the board, but what does it actually mean for education? And then you have this attendant knowledge or conversation around machine learning and AI, which I think can be very, very confusing and challenging for, for lots of us. And I work in a corporation that is, is aggressively moving in that way because the enablement of cloud-based technologies allows the computation of algorithms and solutions based on that data to accelerate at a pace that we've never seen before. So I think that's the first thing I would say, that there is that big macro challenge that's there. I think we're all facing it, both as consumers, as parents, and whether we're in a private organization or a public organization, the, the requirement around, requirements around security, privacy, ethics, uh, need to be paramount in all these discussions uh, and need to be front of mind and we're, when we're thinking about uh, data and what data can do for us. I think, um, and I think that conversation can either be a very negative one or it can be a very positive one. Um, I tend to take the view that if we pay attention, work collaboratively, in some of these areas uh, and deal with the areas of security, privacy, ethics, that it can be a very positive um, scenario for learners, um, particularly as the previous speaker talked about automated assessment and personalized learning. I mean, we need to deal with those issues before we get to that stuff and actually what does that stuff mean, right? What does it mean uh, and how would it work? The pandemic has highlighted the fact to me and to others that the end of year exams for sixth years across the globe didn't necessarily work in the way we thought it was, but you know what? Uh, that gives us a great opportunity to think differently and rethink some of the, some of the, some of the issues. But I think the fundamental issue, the, uh, the data potentially has great opportunity, but it needs to be thought about at a couple of levels. There's a system level, which my two colleagues here have talked about, you know, a data lake or repository, which is very, very challenging. There is the school level, um, and then there's the classroom level, and they require different understanding of what the data can do. And fundamentally, what we tried to do 30 years ago in Boston was actually to go and work with the teachers and skill up everyone in terms of what the data is, what literacy is, what it means, and I think we still need to do that. I mean, um, that's still an <laughs> ongoing conversation about what is the data telling us, how do we use it, what does it mean, and I think that needs to be for, format, format, format in our minds as, as we move forward. And the work that I do with the system, um, particularly here in Ireland, uh, is underpinned by working particularly with the universities, particularly in the research that we do that allows us to work together to try and tease out some of these questions. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot.
And uh, well, going going to what you just mentioned and the research element as well, and uh, the ambitious plans uh, also to manage data at system level. Uh, one of the reasons that France was invited to to introduce their uh, initiatives in the in the panel was the uh, education data hub that you uh, briefly mentioned. Do you do you want to explain a bit more what what its objectives are and how it would work? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the education education data hub project just began. We um, the prefiguration uh, phase was uh, launched in the on the 14th of November, and uh, our first steps is to discuss with the ecosystem stakeholders uh, in order to build um, a project that best meets their needs. Uh, this data platform is intended for researchers, tech players, and national um, education stakeholders, especially uh, local authority, teachers, parents, and students. This project meets four ambitions. The first one is to support the collection and consolidation of uh, education data set with a sovereign framework. The second is to play the role of trusted third party in the opening and sharing of data. The third is to support the educational ecosystem in the development of uses. And the fourth and the last is to ensure the link with students, teachers, and citizens um, by ensuring the transparency on shared data and their uses. It's also a project, the Education Data Hub, um, for supporting the national and European uh, strategy, AI strategy. Uh, and to carry out uh, this project, the ministry uh, had chosen to partner with INRIA. INRIA is a national uh, research institute Institute in Digital Sciences and Technologies. Very good. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And we introduced that other word, which is strategy, that I think it came up uh, fairly fairly often also in our previous conversation. And Tero, I was wondering, you mentioned also some some uh, some concerns, some uh, challenges that you face at uh, at national level in Finland. How would you would you like to elaborate more on those challenges and the context, or, or would you like perhaps to give some examples on how you are tackling that uh, data silos and uh, and various challenges that you will, would encounter to make use of of data national level for informing decision making or to yeah. better education? Well, mm, I think the most challenges concerning education data is on the um, is on the municipality level. I think. So I think in the last panel, Sonia Livingston mentioned something about uh, a lot of things about GDPR and compliance of GDPR and the education providers. And I think the same issues we have in Finland also. So I think that is quite current theme in Finland at the moment. We also have the local DPA has also given us um, given uh, one decision that is um, all, uh, in somewhat similar that the Denmark had in August, I think. So that that brings lots of discussion about what kind of platforms can we use, and also in the Finnish DPA decision, there was also uh, this kind of a questioning of the legal basis, the uh, the legal op um, the legal lawful grounds of using the data. So there is, and also when we are using data, uh, when the lawful grounds is uh, to gather information or data uh, from the students on the basis that the municipalities have to uh, 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 provide education for children. So that's the uh, for primary um, gathering um, um, permit for the data. So for example, if you, if you talk about knowledge management and uh, you want to use the data for secondary purposes. So that's kind of interpretations. Are. So where, where does the limit goes? What is okay, what is not okay? So I think that is the uh, quite hot topic at the moment in Finland. The other, other thing I think uh, what we are trying to uh, achieve in the uh, uh, coming years is impact assessment. So uh, we have lots of uh, 
talk, a lot of talk about learning analytics and digitalization in education. So what we have started, we have started one resource program that looks into what, what is the impact of digitalization to learning, to learning outcomes and also to teaching. So we want to have more uh, data on what is good kind of digitalization in education and how to implement that better, better pedagogically also. So I think those are the two, two things that uh, at the moment are the most, most pressing oh, issues. Yeah. Does that, any of that resonate with, with you as well, Kevin? Um, and also perhaps going back to, to what you were mentioning about the academia and the work you do with universities, do you find that there's evidence on already on the, on the use, on that the, the use of data in education can really better uh, decision making or uh, also at the various level you, you pointed out, uh, student performance, for instance, and learning. Um, what's, what's your view on that? So there's, there's two kind of two questions there. One is the notion of the digital strategy. Uh, I'll deal with that first. So, um, so actually right now we're currently working on a project in Northern Ireland um, with the Education Authority, actually it's a response to a, te a tender. So they, <coughs> and they've been working on this for several years with industry partners. Um, so they're different, they're a centralized system in terms of how they think about technology. Uh, they procure it centrally um, and they manage it centrally by one of these classic managed service providers who essentially run the system. So they have a, approximately 1,100 schools, 30, 40,000 teachers, depending, right? So they, they have that system. They, that, that system, or a variant of that system in place for about 20 years. So that's currently out for tender at the moment, and they're thinking, what are they gonna do for the next 10 years, right? So one of the key strands of work that we're responding to is this notion of what's your data strategy, right? And what is data in AI? And again, as I said earlier, how you think about it at a system level, <coughs> at a school level, and then at a classroom level. And the challenge in Northern Ireland, which is, I'd say, a challenge in most schools, is that they use traditional MIS systems, but they're siloed, right? And, uh, and that's fine, because if you talk to any principal up there, they'll say, don't touch that. We run the school using that MIS system. Don't take that away from us, right? Whereas the system wants something, uh, they want an overall view, potentially, and then you're getting into this conversation around, unstructured data, structured data, data lakes, uh, very complex technology. Um, and so what we would do is, or what our response to some of that is to look at, you can't look at a 10 year horizon this, I think you can look at a five year horizon at the pace of change, right? Uh, and then you can get into sort of strategic thinking around horizon one, horizon two, and horizon three, and how you might think about it, right? So I, we would respond to the system in, in, in in that sort of response. So I think that's a methodology and that would be a standard potentially methodology that you would see most consulting firms would potentially use to think about how you think about your data. But again, it's a, it's a conversation because the data it potentially is, is everywhere. And, um, and it's just, it's grown, it's amorphous and that's fine. But if you want to think about what my colleagues here are thinking about, you need to have that picture and you need to have that debate and it takes time and it's quite complicated, right? The other side of that um, is, you know, the data you're gathering or analytics or using data in schools, is it any good? Right? Does it make any difference? Like, does anyone care, right? That's a different question, right? So, um, and that's a harder question to answer, right? And if you go back to the literature over the last 30 years, Larry Cuban in the States has been really critical or was really critical of devices in classrooms and ed tech and you know there's various different studies over the years as to the good the bad and the ugly um i won't comment on any of that what i can comment on is what we're doing right now right so we got two pieces of work with two different universities which are um really really interesting the first is with Maynooth. so we have a Got into the second phase of a longitudinal study where we have a uh, grant funded by Microsoft Science Foundation Ireland um, to the Discover Science program, looking at STEM-based education for young women in disadvantaged schools. So we just finished phase one of that, which is approximately 1,000 young women. So we're collect we've all that data currently been analyzed. The second phase will hopefully begin in January once the funding is approved. 
which will be a longitudinal study over the next three years um, as we increase the reach. We did Munster, Leinster, now we're going to do Connacht and Ulster, which are regions within the country. That is uh, going to be a co-funded PhD to look at uh, the longitude progress of these learners through the system, through the intervention we make. So that's really exciting, really important. The other project is with DCU and Deirdre Butler is in the audience there, is using Minecraft. So we have a, um, a cluster random, randomized trial design in place uh, using Minecraft as the inter intervention and a whole series of outcomes across 30 schools. Now, um, and we've just, I think we've just about phase one complete in terms of data collection. Uh, it's really, really, so it's, a, it's really, really interesting because it's on the back of two things. One, it's on the back of a program of work we ran last year where we ran a Minecraft competition for primary schools and asked them to build uh, Ireland's future's mind, build a world about sustainability, ran a competition in conjunction with the national provider. Very, very successful from a motivation um, awareness perspective, but did it actually make any difference in the learning? Can't really answer that question. So now we've honed in the research to try and tease that out using experimental design techniques, right? Which is very, very popular in the States. So the states have been at this notion of experimental design, in, in, in other words, control groups and, and randomized control. Not so popular here, certainly not popular here, and not so popular in Europe. Gaining, gaining a bit of traction, but not as, the states have put about 20 year investment in this kind of thinking. Um, and some really interesting s results have emerged, particularly in the area of workforce development, which is slightly different than educational tech. Um, so I think that's something that is, we're really, and it's also on the back of a system, system, systemic review we did of all the literature out there. So we know that no one else has addressed this particular issue, no one else has answered the question we're trying to uh, address, and, and hopefully in the spring we'll have some interesting uh, results. But there's a risk mm -hmm. for me in that, because, you know, Minecraft's a Microsoft product, you could, you could, it could have phenomenal gains or it couldn't, mm -hmm. may not. There may be no effect on the experiment. So there's a risk in that, but um, I think a very minor risk, but there is a risk when you engage in this that you don't get the answer you want, right? Or you get a, you know, and the answer is it's amazing for everyone, please buy more of it. No, it might not be that. So you've got it, you've got, so the, the, what I find really important is the partnership with the universities built over time that there's a series of trust and we're trying to tease out what is of value to the system in whatever area that is. It just happens to be, for us, it's STEM or Minecraft. Um, and I think uh, the value also is that the ethical issues and the data security issues are covered off, in other words, before the study takes place because they have to get approval yep. so that we can collect the data, right? And I think um, evidence-driven policy is key if we don't have evidence-driven policy using data, then there is no point as far as I'm concerned. But that takes time. And the challenge we're facing is that the acceleration of algorithms, AI, and data means that we're always catching up. So um, again, it goes back to the point that it's constant dialogue and uh, debate as, as a, at, a, at a system level, at a country level, as to what we think is important. Not what any other country thinks is important. What do we think is important here? And how we want to use it. I think it's a key point. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and indeed, I mean, uh, what was also mentioned previously in other sessions was that uh, exactly that, uh, that element of, of trust, of course, of, uh, of systemic approach to it, uh, to the collection and use of data. So definitely can uh, build in that relationship in the long term for a certain purpose in a control also to an extent environment uh, with ethical concerns, it's it's an important element. And I would like to make actually the same question to, to Philippe uh, and Tero about the collaboration with other actors, because we heard that, of course, policymakers have a crucial role to play in uh, the management and uh, leveraging of, of data for education purposes. But I, I assume you cannot do it alone, so you would need to partner, and uh, you definitely already need to partner with private partners with academia. Any experiences to share there? Any insights, Philippe? Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, the French ministry has implemented uh, various action to uh, encourage uh, a company 
uh, to support uh, innovative uh, solutions proposed by uh, tech companies. Uh, I would like to mention two. Uh, the first one is uh, the uh, Innovation Partnership and AI uh, launched uh, in uh, 2018. Um, uh, the uh, Innovation Partnership aims to create a teacher assistant uh, for young pupils uh, to learn math and French. And, um, and so far, the French ministry um, has deployed five digital pedagogical solution services based on AI, uh, two for French and three uh, for math. Um, this uh, innovation partnership uh, allowed to co-create, to co-create, I insist, a solution involving uh, edtech players, uh, research labs, uh, teachers and pupils and family. Uh, for these five solutions, about 30 uh, edtech uh, companies and labs were involved, hundreds teachers and thousands uh, pupils. Um, so it was a, a, real, in, in a reality in class. Uh, these uh, five solutions were deployed since September uh, 2022. Moreover, I would like to uh, to, no to, um, to emphasize, emphasize um, another uh, action. Since 2017, we have a special program called uh, uh, EduUp. It's a program to support a tech startup uh, and um, more than 70 companies have benefited from this program and um, some of them uh, won international prices uh, through this program. And all of this uh, and uh, all of this initiative and support must be uh, provided within um, framework that respect interoperability, accessibility, eco-responsibility, and obviously data, data protection. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. And, uh, and I think that, that actually the last part resonated with something that I was, uh, we were actually exchanging about, you know, um, that, that meta model for, for data that could potentially benefit also smaller companies, but, but in general terms, uh, could you also share your view about the collaboration that you have had or other organizations are having with uh, other stakeholders in, in Finland? Yeah, so <coughs> I think when you talk, when we are talking about ed tech uh, companies, we are talking in a wide scale. So we have companies like pers few persons with laptop type of company startups, and also on, the, on, the, on the another side there is like Microsoft and Google and Apple and those big companies. So I think the ed tech uh, sector is quite uh, quite big, and also there's lots of different kind of players. But I think. Uh, and in Finland, I think the ministry's role or the National Agency for Education's role, I think it's quite interesting because uh, the municipalities make contracts with the companies on the services that they use. And uh, the municipalities or the s education providers talk to us that what they need from the companies. And the companies sometimes or often comes, comes to us and say, what do we, we want in the future? So I think we are in, in somewhat in some kind of... in, in, in this kind of intermediary <laughs> uh, body in between. But I think, and, and also another thing, there is like this cultural thing that has been happening. So when I started in 2015 and we were trying to, um, we implemented a meta model for learning uh, material. So we have uh, made this local nationwide meta model for learning uh, material that uses LRMI and Dublin Core elements on, on it. And uh, in 2015, 2016, when we started, the, there was a lot, lots of resistance towards that. So every company wanted to have their own. And it, it was seen as this kind of competitive edge to another company. So, but at the moment, we have, we, were, we have been approached by the companies that they want to use the similar model on the learning materials. So I think what we can do, uh, to level the playing field, for example, for the smaller one and the mid-sized companies, is to 
provide these meta models that uh, they can use on their um, on their um, uh, software or uh, um, planning of those dis um, digital platforms or apps, and but also also uh, the, the, there are also services that we can provide. For example, one of these services that we provide at the moment is the National Agencies for Education's uh, single sign-on service that uh, both the municipalities can use and also the companies can use. And I think these kinds of services are familiar to other countries as well. So I think those kinds of things that we can we can do. But there has also been discussions that maybe the ministry or the agency <laughs> should uh, do one size one size, one, one size fits all kind of service to everybody. So I think that's not the way we should supposed to go. So it's, it's not the government's um, place, place to have this kind of one ring rule them all type of platform. But at the, at the other hand, I'm also concerned as in the last panel, I'm also uh, a bit concerned about the commercialization of the learning environment. So we have to look into that as well. So I think it, 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 we need this kind of discussion that what is good platform for education and what is there any like national or European wide standards how to do them so and and uh, and when we and we need this research uh, to base this development on so when we have research that says that this is good approach this is not so good approach then we can implement those into standards or something like that. But uh, interoperability work is hard work, and, and it, it, uh, it, 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 it requires that all the parties agree on that. So uh, there's also this, if we go and invest in interoperability work, we have to uh, think about what is the return on investment. So uh, that's, that's, I think, one of the discussion. And before we got all the actors in the same table uh, talking about that, it's, it's, it's a very, very, very big effort. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, before going on with the questions, I was just uh, eager to see if anybody would like to ask any questions to our guests or would like to share any experiences, perspectives from your own countries, if something clicked about what uh, was mentioned until now. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Karol. I'm from Poland. I represent a edtech company. Um, in a nutshell, we take care of uh, teachers' professional development. We teach them how to use technology in a way by passing technology to students and focus on onboarding training uh, methodology, really. Um, and we also use a combination of uh, different technologies like 3D design, 3D printing, robotics, and recently we also experiment with Minecraft and how to combine Minecraft with uh, 3D printing, for instance. Um, so in a nutshell, I represent like a smaller like SME uh, type of companies, and I think our challenge is to get access to, uh, let's say, ministries of education or people who are running um, pilot projects, uh, because this is probably a win-win, um, an arrangement that we can think of. So namely, we as a small company are very focused on, and there are like hundreds of smaller companies within Europe spread across all countries that have distinct knowledge about the education system, about the needs for teachers and all of that. So in our case, what would be very helpful is to help us get exposure to Ministry of Education, agree on some framework, how to cooperate, uh, provide some funding for us to create meaningful pilots, follow the advice of a teachers and exactly measure what's working, what's not dependent on the specific case by case in every country, and then create, like co-create a uh, evidence-based solutions that can meet certain countries' needs. Because the running situation is that we have big players who come, come up with like standardized solutions, they don't really, I think they don't put much effort on pre providing long-term service and support for teachers to get around and to help them be better at work. Um, so the question is how to make smaller product-driven companies more visible in order to provide more effective support for teachers. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. And well, I think partially was 
touched upon, but there's much more probably to be added. Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you have anything to comment on that, uh, because I was wondering also for smaller companies, uh, how what's what's the perspective of Microsoft, for instance, because I guess you also work with smaller um, providers and you, you had them grow and enter into the ecosystem or not really? Um, so we have a number of programs that smaller startups, and it's, it's startups across the board. It's not just in ed tech, it's in um, finance, science. So there's a program that each company can apply to be part of uh, through, the, through their local subsidiary. Um, not without its challenges, it's hard for small startups to get um, uh, to get uh, to get a, to get it integrated into bigger companies and into, into the ministry, uh, there are certain there are some quite good incubators within Ireland in terms of there's one Nova in, in, attached to UCD and there's another Tangent uh, or Dogpatch Labs attached to Trinity and wider. So there are there are models. Um, it it sometimes just it's luck and it's a bit of timing and it depends on the solution, you know that. At a particular time, there's a particular piece of technology that adds to say whether it's our platform <coughs> that captures some of the imagination in schools. Uh, but it is difficult. There's no doubt about it. Um, um, but it is the lifeblood of of the system. So it does it does need a bit of work, um, and it needs investment, and um, probably needs probably a relook at from a European perspective as is there a better way to do it. Absolutely, yeah. I think the, the experience of the Impact Tech, tech pro program uh, it was went along the, that line to actually um, support startups in the tech sector, but also create that shared um, understanding and, and consensus around what, what's useful, for instance, for education. It, it creates awareness on the ethical concerns that are attached to it. Um, do you want to comment or uh, add something to what you already mentioned about the involvement or support to startups into oh. national pilots, for instance? Do you want to pick in? Uh, please do. Yeah. So I agree. It's, it's a hard process. And uh, the startups that come, for example, in the ministry are always disappointed because we cannot like say that to the education providers that here's a good product, buy it. So that's not our uh, role. And, and I think in Finland, for example, if you would like to come to Finland and have a, some kind of market, there are like two, two I think, approaches. One is this, accel this kind of startup acceleration program that is funded by the other branch of the government. And then there are these ex uh, exhibitions uh, annually that is called, and there is like this vendor sales, but, but I'm, I don't have, unfortunately, the silver bullet for them here. Uh, I don't know how does it, it happen in uh, Poland? But in France, the question um, was uh, asked uh, a long time ago because um, many offers from tech companies and uh, um, many failures. So uh, we decided to, uh, uh, to have a, uh, two action, as I said, big action with a found of um, uh, 16 million euros for the, uh, f uh, the first uh, partnership, innovation partnership. And we are going to, to uh, put uh, 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 36 million for uh, uh, the years, the three years uh, um, coming. And, and for the smaller, tech companies. We have this program, EduUp. Uh, this program is open for all the, uh, the tech companies, French or foreigners. Um, you have to respect uh, data protection uh, laws and uh, the ASIC uh, and uh, confidence framework of the Ministry of National Education. And it means uh, uh, neutrality, commercial neutrality, and um, uh, equ uh, tra uh, equ um, e treatment, equity, equity treatment. Sorry, um, and it's not 
also it's not uh, not not only a problem of money it's a problem of business model and also um, to uh, to uh, to to co-create something useful with meaning for teachers and sometimes sorry to say that but uh, i'm very humble uh, <laughs> um, just my language is uh, difficult for me but uh, the, the problem is that you have a good idea but it's not the tools for teachers is your idea so what we are going to do is to uh, permit you to co-create tools with teachers and pupils in um, uh, field experimentation during one year with EduUp program. It's possible, it's open, and uh, it's free. Very good. That's very practical uh, experience. There was another question, I think, from, uh, ah, from uh, on the left. Hi. Um, my name is Barbara Watson. I'm the professor at the University of Bergen in Norway, but also the director of the National Center for Learning Analytics, which is funded by the ministry since 2016. And sometimes I think we talk past each other because as a researcher in learning analytics, when we're looking at it, we're really looking at classroom data and how we understand learning and learning processes and things. And then when we look at the data that when we hear talking on the policy level, we're talking about the traditional data that we've had for a long time. And we sort of don't have a, a matching between, between this. And I think that um, where, uh, and when we look at the talks you've had this morning, like what, what is actually is data? I mean, we work a lot with data literacy and, and just getting people to understand that your voice is data um, as well is really important. So there's a lot of work to do there. But I think that when we're looking at the uh, ethical and legal frameworks, it's really, really detailed when it comes down to the data. So we spent, um, with <coughs> our projects where we're looking at adaptive learning tools in schools, we spent nine months with the data protection agency and the legal person working with us looking at what we actually can do with the data. And it really gets down to the level of the algorithms that you can, and in Norway, we came to the agreement that Parents cannot pull their children out from the use of adaptive tools, but they can pull the data out from being used for the training of algorithms. I mean, it gets down to that level. So I think we have such a wide specter of issues about the use of data that we sort of need a better mapping of what data is actually being used at the, you know, at the national level in the ministries all the way to what's going on in classrooms. So it's very diverse and uh, there's a lot more work needed. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody would like to address that point, Tero? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a very good commentary. I th thank you for that. And and I think also we. I think there is. I think it's time. Oh, there is a um, requirement also to discuss about the data itself, lifespan of the data. I think we have this notion at the moment that when the data is collected, it's eternal forever. So I think we have to also discuss about when the uh, controller is making contracts with something, it has to uh, uh, very in detail level uh, describe how the data is used, when it's going, when the data will be destructed and stuff like that. I think there's lots of things that we have to improve in the um, uh, compliance of the GDPR, I think, and I just that wanted to add. Thank you. Anything? Yeah. Um, we, we talk about uh, data literacy, data literacy and uh, transparency of algorithm. But uh, because we are, all of us, we are convinced that uh, what we are doing is useful and there is a meaning. But outside, uh, especially in France, many of the teachers think that it's not useful and they are afraid about that. So when we talk about data and transparency, we have to make them touch, really touch, and we co-create algorithm with them. We, um, we try to uh, make them understand what they, they, they are using this tool and not this tool. 
and why they have to, to do it um, with the liberty of pedagogical uh, in, uh, that uh, uh, France and constitution, French constitution assure to the, to the, to the teacher, French teacher. So we have to make them touch the reality of not that is real. You know, I don't know if it's I, um, I can express better. Um, in a way, we have to, to make them understand that algorithm is a solution among several solutions. It's not the best, but it's a solution. And we have to work to improve algorithm. And what's happened in, the, in daily life, we put money, and at the end, we have no money to go on, and it's a problem because the algorithm that we use is the only one, and they, we make it the best, and it's a problem, and the only one, and it's a problem. And we need some determinism for the, ma for the machine. Uh, when you, you ask for the computer to be determinism, what, what, what does it mean? Two plus two makes four. That's the reality of the machine. And when the, you, you calculate it's complex, you, you need some determinism. But for the human being that we, what, that we are, we, are we, we fight against determinism. And that's why we have to acculturate, to, to make them understand why th they need some type of tools to make them an easy, um, make them uh, the, 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 the daily uh, um, education day uh, more easier. Thank you. Uh, there was perhaps, a, I hope it's a comment perhaps, so it's Please go ahead because we have very few few minutes. Please do. How we the microphone? Thank you. It it, it was more a question. To what extent do you see or do you use? Uh, public procurement as a way to strengthen uh, the collaboration between ministries and yeah. businesses? Would you like to take this? Yes. Yeah. We, we, uh, we launched a program uh, seven years ago, and we, uh, we made some uh, new public tenders, the partnership, innovation partnership, with no... Um, Criteria uh, which keep aloof the startup or lit or smaller ed tech. Uh, we so we we make them uh, we help to uh, uh, access to the public tenders and uh, uh, for all the public tenders uh, in this in, in this case it was um, startup without experience experiences it was a risk for us but they have uh, competencies human resources id um, and uh, the second one is uh, no uh, um, uh, i don't know the word in, in english but uh, business uh, model um, and no um, no shield uh, d'affaires si quelqu'un peut m'aider turnover turnover yes and it was a risk. And uh, when you go to the Ministry of Finance to explain that, they say, no, no, it's not possible. And we insist. And now we have um, uh, companies, head tech companies, um, which uh, are present. They make tools and they go abroad to, uh, make, to uh, make their, their job uh, in US uh, and all over the Europe.
Thank you very much to, uh, for you to participate actively to this conversation. Thank you to our guests. We now have to close to don't uh, take time and space to the next uh, breakout sessions. I will share just a, a brief uh, recap uh, via Twitter, perhaps, which I did with chat GDP, that, that GPD, the, that uh, tool that my colleague mentioned before. But uh, yeah, please just uh, thank with me our guest uh, speakers for today and the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.